When tensions rise in your home, do you or your spouse shut down? I mean, I really want you to ask yourself this question. Can you go days or even weeks without talking to each other after you have an argument? Are you tired of getting the silent treatment when things don't go your way? Guys, in today's episode, we are on part four of four, and we're talking about stonewalling your partner in marriage. This series has been all about toxic communication, and I got to tell you that the silence and the coldness that develops when you stonewall your partner can really drive an immovable wedge between you and your spouse. But I got to tell you guys, Stephanie and I've done this to each other too. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to be this way. You can work through this, the, all of these toxic communication patterns, specifically stonewalling in this one. If you use the tools that were given you during every single episode, we know these tools work not from a philosophical standpoint, (laughs) but we know these tools work because we have used them because all four pieces of this series, this four part series, we have done every single one of these toxic communication patterns to each other. So look guys, welcome to the legacy driven marriages podcast, episode 56. I'm Walt McKinley and I'm here with my beautiful wife and my partner in crime, Stephanie. Oh, Hey everybody, (laughs) man. We love that you're here. So take a second before we really get rolling, hit that subscribe button. That helps us continue to build this movement, but more importantly, we get to do it with you and you don't have to miss an episode. So Stephanie, and by the way, thank you for just showing up today for our crowd. (laughs) Um, Normally we try to stay a week or two ahead on the podcast in case one of us gets sick. It's been bananas. We actually just got an opportunity to do our first corporate fortune 500 marriage reset workshop, which Stephanie killed it in. And, uh, but then she also got sick by our 17 year old (laughs) who brought home I don't even know if it's COVID, if it's flu. Is there a thing that goes either way anymore? She's just sick, but she's yeah. here. I'm sorry, you guys, if you're, you might hear me clearing my throat a lot this episode, but yeah, our daughter was sick and she got both of us sick and I'm just kind of, uh, I still have this crud. I don't know. <laughs> it's not going away. So sorry, you might hear my voice a little bit rough and I'll probably be clearing my throat, but just know I showed up. <laughs> So just give Steph a shout out on social media. Tell her thank you for showing up. She is doing this for you guys and trying to be here without a fail every single week. You know what's crazy is when we did our marriage workshop, we looked up some statistics and not surprising, but 75% of all marriages have communication issues. I actually think it's probably 100%. I mean, don't we all have communication (laughs) issues in our marriage? And 25% of those are communication issues that revolve around silencing each other, like being quiet, stonewalling. Like we're going to talk about all of these ways that stonewalling shows up in your marriage. We're going to give you guys some real examples like the last few weeks, but man, this will drive a wedge like nothing else. When you shut down emotionally, verbally in your relationship, it starts to become really hard to come back from. My guys, I got to be honest. Um, This one I'm real familiar with because this is my natural tendency when I feel hurt or upset is to shut down, is to stop communicating. And honestly, that's a sign. <clears throat> I think for a lot of us, if you're someone, if you know your partner and your partner is n- normally willing to communicate about things and they're pretty open about things and suddenly they're just shutting down and not sharing anything and giving you the silent treatment and that kind of, that's usually an indicator that there's a real issue there that you really need to get to the bottom of pretty quickly because it's not going to go anywhere good from there. And we're going to kind of share with you guys <clears throat> a quite a few different examples of what this looks like. And I'm sure there's a lot of you out there very familiar with this. As I am. Yeah. By the way, as always like, be honest with yourself. If you do these things, Stephanie and I have both done some of these things we're going to go over with you. I've definitely done, I, I'm more verbal. I'm more assertive. I want to have the conversation. So stonewalling mm-hmm. isn't really my jam forcing you to have the conversation (laughs) is not healthy in the moment either. Um, That's kind of more where I come from. But like Steph said, she'll stonewall or he has in the past. And these are things that we all really got to work through. These are things that are formed from our, I got to say from, I'm glad that you, this was not your go-to because this is what kept us from getting to a really, you know, we know a lot of couples where both people will do this. Mm -hmm. And if you both aren't speaking to each other and you go days and weeks without speaking to each other, Ooh, you're going to have a really hard climb to come back out because once that communication shuts down, that's kind of where it all shuts down. So um, I'm really glad that, you know, Walt and I are opposites. So yeah. he was the type always like, 
pushing to have the talk. Thank goodness, because that allowed us to allow that communication to keep going. And you need that in your relationship. Yeah. I mean, how can you or your spouse make it out of the hole that maybe you've dug into in your relationship? And, and if you're not even willing to have a conversation around the underlying problem, that's actually driving the wedge that got you to the point of stonewalling each other in the first place. We can't tell you how many couples we've seen this with mm -hmm. in recent marriage workshops, couples that we've known for decades. The first thing I want to talk about is the silent treatment. When one partner ignores another one completely, like you don't even respond to messages. You don't respond to calls. Any attempts at conversation are met with like that one word answer. If you say anything at all, and you're really doing this for prolonged periods. I mean, we talked to a couple they would go days, sometimes weeks without talking, thinking in their head the whole time. I'm not going to be the one to break. I'm not mm -hmm. saying something until you say something to me. And the other person's thinking the same thing. And then nothing said at all, which is worse <laughs> than maybe having an argument out loud. Right. At least if you're talking, you can get at least figure out where that person's coming from. But if they just won't even talk about it, where do you go from there? It's you kind of can't. You're going to be stuck in that. Um, really bad cycle of wanting to do that back to them. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's the opposite of the good thing um, of reciprocity. Mm. You know, reciprocity can work really in your benefit, but man, when you're in that tornado of emotion, when you're in that spiral of negativity in your relationship that I'm not going to talk to you, if you don't talk to me and, and the other person saying, I'm not talking to you, if you don't talk to me and they're just waiting for each other, mm -hmm. someone to say, sorry, when really both people need to be adult enough in the moment and realize, Hey, if our marriage is failing, both of us are losing. We got to create this team win and we got to have this conversation maybe that we haven't had for a little while. And the next one is the refusal to discuss issues. So this is a little different. I know it sounds like the silent treatment, but it's a little different in that, you know, they might still talk to you about things that don't have to do with the problem that's going on. Like, They'll still discuss the things maybe with the kids or other really, you know, other things going on in your life, but they won't discuss those real issues. They always kind of find a way to avoid the issue. And that's not good either because you still need to be able to discuss what's underlying because otherwise those resentments just build. And we know what happens <laughs> when the resentments build. Right. We talked about those expectations not being met and you're disappointed and that leads to a resentment and those resentments build up. And before you know it, then you're, you can't see any good. These conversations that we're talking about, the financial ones, the ones about how you're going to raise your kids, the ones about spirituality, even sometimes the conversation sex, the conversations you're not having remind me of the undertow and the ocean. And the undertow in the ocean is really dangerous because you can't see it at the surface, but it's there. And if you get caught in that undertow, it just drags you out to sea and it could drown you. That's what we're doing in our relationships by not having the critical conversation in the areas maybe we're not necessarily comfortable having them in. You've got to lean in to those difficult issues and have those discussions. And the next thing is I talked about it sex a minute ago. It's physical withdrawal. And I got to tell you, ladies, I hear from men do this way more typically than men do. It's a very transactional relationship. If you're not doing this, then I'm not doing this for you. And, and typically, if a woman feels like a man's not doing something for her, then we're not going to have sex. And there's a physical withdrawal there. And, and let's be real, sex in its beauty is a way to connect and become one. And also, it's the physical intimacy piece that's one of the three pieces that we talked about before that we really need when it comes to intimacy. That's scratching backs. That's holding each other's hands. And yes, that's sex too. It's all of those things. So when you withdraw physically, man, I, I mean, it's a slippery slope to maybe somebody going around and cheating on you. Cause if you're not willing to date your spouse and if you're not willing to do those things, somebody else is. I'm just going to add, it's not just sex. Um, because it's mentioned here that, um, this could be like if the subject comes up, they leave the room, mm -hmm. they go for a walk, they turn away from the other person when they speak. So they're not physically engaging with you. Then you know there's an issue. There's an underlying issue there. Yeah. And the next thing is one word responses. <laughs> We've all done this. Like, I'm fine. Go ahead. <laughs> you know, just a couple syllables in there. And that's all you're willing to give your spouse in your short, curt, 
shitty tone reply mm-hmm. that you just gave to them. I, I know I've done this one. <laughs> so no judgment. If you've done it, give yourself some grace, uh-huh. but stop. I've definitely done it too. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anybody that probably hasn't done that. <laughs> because when you are mad, you just tend to, you'll just say enough to just be like, they let them know you're mad without actually having to say anything else. Well, it's like when, they, when you tell your spouse and they're really pissing you off, you're like, whatever. But really what you want to say after that is a F you. <laughs> You know, because you're so pissed, but you know, you can't say that next piece or it'd be very inappropriate or that's crossing a boundary and crossing a line in your relationship. You don't want to cross. So you're like, whatever. And then you just walk away. Yeah. So just so you guys know, saying I'm fine or whatever is not communicating. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's why this is one of the, this is one of the areas of stonewalling is you give just a couple syllable answer back to your spouse. So don't think it just a silent treatment is what we're talking about. So when they say everything okay and you say, I'm fine, um, you're clearly not fine and you need to elaborate on that. (laughs) Yeah, I just want to do a couple more of those. Why don't you take that one? Uh, No, this using diversion tactics. Ooh, we've seen people do this. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I recognize this one for Walt. (laughs) Walt does this one a lot. (laughs) Call me out right now, y'all. Come on, somebody come save me. Where's all the men at? Yeah, when you're trying to talk about what's going on and they just change the subject on you, you know that they're diverting the subject for a reason because they don't want to talk about it. And that's usually the indicator. All these things are like, these are those warning signs. Like when you see this happen, that means you do need to sit down and have a real conversation Mm -hmm. and make the time for it. You know, the thing is, in part three of this (laughs) four-part series, we talked about defensiveness. I, I have a tendency based upon the way that I was raised to just take things defensively even when they're met with pure heart, it's just a little bit of feedback that I need to receive because maybe it's a blind spot or maybe it's just a conversation we need to have in our marriage. I know quickly I can try to turn that conversation around and make it about the other person. And that's mm-hmm. something I've been really intentional and hard um, working on very hard. So if, if you have a tendency to turn the conversation around when your partner tries to talk to you about something critical in your relationship and you make it about them and how they're not showing up just because you've gotten defensive, Take a step back and take a breath and realize if it's coming from a good place from your partner, there's some healing and there's some work that you guys really need to do in your relationship there. But more importantly, you need to do internally with yourself. Hmm. I agree with that one. Um, I don't know what the, they have timeouts on here, but I don't want people to confuse. Timeouts can be a really good thing, but they can also be a bad thing. The timeout is bad if you call timeout and walk away and then you never come back to talk about it. Then you left that unresolved and you're leaving your partner feeling frustrated and it's unresolved. Take the timeout if you need to because you know your emotions are out of control and it's not going to go anywhere good because you know you're just not in the space to have that kind of conversation at that moment. Then by all means, take the timeout. But you have to revisit the conversation when you've calmed down, don't leave it out there just to, you know, nothing was resolved and they don't know how you felt about it because then it becomes a resentment. And I think in those moments, you really need to schedule the time to have the conversation in the heat of the moment, in the heat of the battle sometimes, and we know arguing with your spouse sometimes can feel like a battle. Do you know it's being escalated? Do you know tempers are starting to get hot? You take a time out. You know what? We're not saying anything constructive. Let's stop. We'll revisit this conversation. Then schedule a time to revisit it. Even if it's maybe 24 hours later, 48 hours later, give both people time to reset emotionally, maybe write down some thoughts that they have and come back with the solution focused approach on how you can work through the issue and compromise and then come out the other side of that with a team win. That's really important versus what Stephanie said. Time out. It's getting hot. We're really escalated. Nothing's going to come from this. And then you just sweep it under the rug and nobody talks about it again. That Mm -hmm. is the fastest way to draw a divide and be on that slippery slide to divorce. Not talking about something is the worst thing that you can do. So so we gave you guys some solid examples, right? Always build self-awareness. That's how we feel about it. Now Mm -hmm. we're going to talk about what can you do to show up in your relationship with more patience and understanding 
and really effectively communicate differently, especially if you have a tendency to stonewall. <laughs> like Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> got him. <laughs> yes. Like me too. Okay, guys, I got I to admit it too. <laughs> so the first one we're going to talk about is creating that safe, supportive environment for communication to happen. This is really, really important. Um, the only way your partner is going to open up is if they feel like they're going to be seen and heard. So to, in order to do that, we've talked a lot about this, that speaker listener technique is really mm -hmm. um, one of the best ways to do this to where you both get a chance to speak and you both get a chance to hear each other out and both feet people leave that feeling seen and heard because you have to actually repeat back to your partner what you hear them saying and they get a chance to let you know if it's correct or not and you know both people will get a chance to say what they need to say and you can move on from there and try to have a solution for both of you where you both compromise and everybody wins as a team <laughs> And in those moments, it's continuing the I statements. It's always I, the problem, and the solution. Which is not your spouse. <laughs> I, the problem, and the solution. That's how you have a constructive conversation in your marriage. And then you got to leave out words like always, never, and you. And the you part of that is probably the hardest thing to leave out of those conversations. Because let's be real, part of the problem you feel like in the moment when you're upset is your spouse. But if you take a step back and you look at a deeper layer, the spouse isn't your problem. The issue that you guys are having trouble working through becomes the problem. So find the solution to that and make sure that you're using I statements. It's great, Steph. The speaker listener technique is so pro. Hmm. When you can do it, it feels so mechanical and awkward and unusual <laughs> at first. But man, when you can dig into that, you could do that really well. You can have some serious conversations in your relationship and come out winning together, arms locked, hand in hand, marching forward in life and being happy. Because if you, I just want to share this, because if, for instance, um, you were arguing over something and you were trying to explain your side of that, but your partner keeps interrupting and saying, no, that's not how it was. No. Like this is, this is what happened. And, and they keep cutting you off and they keep telling you what happened. Do you think you're going to keep communicating with them? I wouldn't, I'm going to stop and just say, never mind. You obviously can't hear me. And then I'm not going to share anymore. It's going to shut down the communication. So it's really important that we don't interrupt or disrupt or tell our partner how they feel or you can't, you can only speak for yourself. And, and that's the most important thing to remember when you have these conversations is try to stick to only speaking for yourself and not blaming your partner. Because we use this example a lot. If, if you come to your partner and you're like, God, there's always the Amazon packages showing up. You're always spending all the money. You, 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 you know, and you're just coming at your partner, like you're blaming. And immediately they're just going to be on the defense to defend themselves versus coming to them and saying, hey, I'm feeling like um, I'm getting a little worried about our savings account. It's, it seems like it's really getting low. Like, can we sit down and look at this together and maybe write down a budget or figure something out to where we can like stop this? You know, when you come to them and say, I feel this way and, you know, here's my solution. If you come to them that way, they're disarmed. They're not feeling like you're not attacking them. They're like, oh, you're bringing this problem to me, but obviously you've thought about some kind of solution. So yeah, I, I can do that. Do you see how different that looks when you're coming at them in a way that's aggressive and you're attacking versus I'm coming to you to say, hey, I feel like I'm feeling like this. You're letting them know how you feel. You're not blaming. You're bringing the problem you see. And maybe they don't see it, or maybe they have a different point of view, but then they have a chance to say that without feeling like it's, they have to defend themselves. They're just going to say they see it differently. Yeah. And when you created that safe and supportive environment that we're talking about, really then you encourage your spouse to openly communicate with you. 
your spouse is never going to communicate with you if you don't create this safe, open environment where they can do so. But when you do that, and then you go to your spouse and you say, hey, I really want to hear what you think about this. Here's kind of my thoughts. Here's my solution. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Then as a spouse that's receiving that, you say, okay, here, here, what I'm hearing you say is you want to spend a little less on Amazon and, and a big cable bill and maybe going out to dinner too many times per month so that we can save some money because it stresses you out. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, it kind of stresses me out too, but I don't want to just save money and not enjoy life. So then they tell you what their solution looks like. And then you get closer because most of the time, even God, when you're talking politics or when you're talking anything in life, the loudest voices in the room typically are going to get the most heard the most. Right. Mm -hmm. But that makes people feel not seen and not heard because some people just shut down. That's how they are. Some people don't want to argue about it anymore. So they shut down. This is where stonewalling happens. But when you can have these conversations, and both people feel validated. Both people feel seen and heard. Both people are encouraging their spouse to give their opinion, knowing their spouse's opinion is part of the solution that you're building together. Then you create this environment where you can have every conversation you need to, to have a happy marriage. Because mm -hmm. a happy marriage only comes from the struggle. It's easy when it's, going, <laughs> when it's on easy street. Th those two for first two, three years of puppy love, when, when things aren't really getting on your nerves or it's not that big of a deal, those th same things that you felt like weren't worthy enough for you to have a conversation 10 years in are grinding your gears. <laughs> They're pissing you off. They're making you upset. So you've got to have those conversations with your spouse, but you've got to do it in a constructive way. That cr safe space, the culture of a supportive environment, a culture of open communication, those are kind of one A and one B, mm -hmm. one and two, whichever way you want to put them, to starting the dialogue that you need to have in your relationship. Yeah, so the next one is address your underlying issues. And this is a big one, too, because I, we see this a lot. We've done it to each other. It's uncomfortable, right? <laughs> this is uncomfortable. Yes. This is very uncomfortable because a lot of times we're only addressing what's happening right in front of us. or Sometimes it feels like, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but sometimes you feel like your partner's attacking you out of nowhere and you're like, where's this even coming from? Like, mm -hmm. and that's usually a sign of that's an underlying issue. Because yeah. if that's you know undertow. you didn't really do anything and there was no conflict until they just came in and they were suddenly, they have conflict, then that's probably a sign that there's some underlying issue going on for them and they're just attacking you in that moment because you're standing in front of them <laughs> this is this happens a lot because you know there could have been something where the kids were stressing you out that day and now you're in a mood or you're at work and something happened and now you're in a mood and sometimes there's even just something maybe going on with your other family extended family and or you have i know like Walt has a lot of physical pain if you're experiencing things like that and you don't you know, maybe you're just not even thinking about, you're just irritable because of it. And then you just take it out on the person in front of you. We all do it. So this is really important though, in those moments, if you can recognize that, don't feed into it. Take a second to let that, like, don't answer right away to them. If you take a second and then you say, is everything okay? And that kind of disarms them in that moment to be like, you know what? No, it's not okay. Like, mm -hmm. and they have a chance to explain without you, you know, returning the fire <laughs> or, you know, if you shoot back with something, then now you're off to the races. You're both going to just, it, it's going to escalate from there to where you're just yelling at each other and nobody wants that. So, <laughs> yeah. And I think the next thing around this is, Stop running from the triggers. When you get triggered emotionally and you want to react and fire away at your spouse, don't run from that moment. Start to take a step back, take a breath, compose yourself maybe, and then realize, and sometimes this has to be after the moment, realize, hey, there's an area that I need to work on in my relationship. There's an area that I need to work on maybe from some childhood trauma that I haven't resolved. Maybe it's from a previous relationship experience I haven't resolved that I'm bringing into this. So those triggers aren't a bad thing. I think people always talk sign. about them in such a negative way. Mm -hmm. 
it's just an opportunity to show you real live and in person an area that you still have some growth or some healing that you need to lean into pretty heavily. I know for me, you guys, a lot of you guys, if you've been listening to the podcast for any length of time, you know that I've had a really traumatic childhood. For me, I realized that I was bringing a bunch of negative attributes into my relationship. And if I really wanted to be driven by love instead of being driven by hate or I'm going to, I'm going to get my life together. I'm going to create this family in spite of the things that I've been through. I needed to dig in and lean in on some healing that I had to do too. And that takes us to the next thing. Sometimes you need to seek professional help. We have this stigma in our society and people are so judgmental of others that are going through therapy or need counseling. And by the way, this is where Gen Z gets it right. Gen Z is all about therapy and counseling and these things to get these unresolved issues that we're sitting on out of the way. Sometimes counseling, you need to go individually to do some individual healing, but sometimes you need that mediator in your marriage. And by having that, that person that can look, really see it objectively and give you sound, solid advice in the moment where it's not just your way and your spouse think it's their way and you're never coming to a, um, a solution or re resolution together. And you can lean in with somebody who does this as their profession you're going to have a great relationship because of those things. And that we, we go buy coffee, we go out to dinner. God, we do all these things and spend our money on so many by thousand dollars cell phones, <laughs> but we won't go spend a thousand or 2000 or 3000 or hell $5,000 to save the most important relationship that we have in our life. The relationship that's not only going to make each other happier in our marriage, but it's also going to have a profound impact on our children on whether or not we get divorced or whether or not we're willing to commit, go to therapy and come out of that season of our relationship stronger than we've ever, because we've shown each other the level of commitment we can have. Don't lack when it comes to spending money in counseling or therapy or marriage retreats or marriage conferences or whatever it is that's going to put your marriage back on the right track. Sometimes you just need that extra voice in there that's going to give you some clarity that you're not seeing in the moment. Yeah, and sometimes it's hard to, if you're in a place where, because trust me, Walton, I've been here, <laughs> um, where we just, you know, if you get to that point where it's like you almost can't even stand each other and you mm -hmm. really can't even, then that's really the time to probably go see a counselor and have that mediator. And because sometimes we, it really is all about feeling seen and heard, you guys, when we don't feel seen and heard. And sometimes it's just really hard to get our partner to a place where they can do that. Then you need that, that person in the middle that can kind of create that for you and have someone that hears you out. And maybe they can get through to your spouse in a way that you couldn't in that moment. You know, for us, we didn't actually go to professional counseling, but we went to a marriage conference mm -hmm. and just hearing other people's perspective on and hearing that we weren't alone in how we felt it was huge. And it did a lot for being a catalyst to getting us to communicate again, because it was like, Oh, you know, the way they put that, that's how I feel. And then we were able to understand each other better and that we were just coming from a different place. Even the marriage workshop we're facilitating now, one of the folks in there this last week said that specific thing. Do you remember? It's so nice to know that we're not alone in our struggle, that there's other people going through the same types of things that we're going through. Mm -hmm. You know, the specifics might be different, but the, the biggest parts of the struggle is very similar in relationships. We all go through them. Stephanie and I don't do this podcast to cast judgment. We don't do this podcast for our own <laughs> egos. It takes a lot of effort and work to do it. We do this because we want you to win in your relationship. We know what it's like to be on the footstep of divorce. And we also know what it's like to really build something legendary. We know that because we committed to leaning into the deepest, darkest parts of our relationships to ourselves and doing the work together. Even if sometimes we don't want to, what we realized and what we want you guys to realize, and the reason we did a four-part series is every single time you feel challenged in your relationship, it's an opportunity to make you guys stronger together. 
Every time you argue, it's an opportunity to see if you can find a resolution together. Every time that maybe you don't like your spouse in the season that you're mm-hmm. in, it's an opportunity to be in gratitude and, and realize why you love them and how important that relationship really is to you. And if you can focus on those things and you can really work on the four parts of these series that we just talked about, mm-hmm. you will come out three months, six months, 12 months, profoundly different. And you will turn around and say the hardest moments in our marriage is what's made us so happy today because we chose to do the work instead of running from it. Yeah. I just want to touch on those four, the four toxic communication habits that we've covered was (laughs) Contempt. contempt, criticism, defensiveness, and now stonewalling. And I'm sure if you're being honest with yourself, (laughs) as we have had to be, (laughs) um, you probably recognize all of them. Maybe you don't do all of them. Maybe your partner does. Maybe you, you know, maybe you do a couple of them. Maybe your partner does the other couple, but I'm sure in there you can see and recognize probably all four of them. I know we have done different ones (laughs) at different times in our relationship and we have really had to work at like I said, my natural, my natural tendency is to stonewall when I'm upset. And like I said, thank goodness. I think that's why God put Walt in my life is that he did not allow me to really go to that place because it's not how he deals with it. So, (laughs) you know, it's a good thing. Um, and if you're in that place, like we said, if you're both stonewalling each other, really make sure you're, you reach out, reach out and get some help from someone who who could listen to you as, you know, as unbiased as they can to get you through that place so that you can see that you need to talk about it. I mean, don't just shut down. It doesn't, it won't do anyone any good. You can't win in in your marriage if you just shut down. And it takes someone to be like, hey, we just really need to talk about this. It takes, it takes humbling yourself and saying like, because all of that is, it really is pride and ego that you just won't speak about it. It's your pride that's, that's making you do that. It takes humbling yourself to say, you know, we really need to talk about this. And I need to, you know, be an adult in this moment and realize, like, I can't act like, you know, because sometimes it, it is. You're kind of acting like a child in that moment where it's like, no, I'm just going to dig in my heels. I'm not going to do anything. That's that's not going to get anyone anywhere. Everybody, we want to come to a solution in our marriage. That's how we move our marriage forward. It's not to be petty and hold on to these grievances and, you know, win the fight because you don't win the fight. If you're winning the fight, your marriage is losing. That's what we're trying to get through to you guys is you really have to put this effort into your marriage or you won't have one. Man, look, guys, we want you guys to stay plugged in. The most important thing you can do for your marriage is stay plugged in in areas that help strengthen your marriage. Go to LegacyDrivenMarriages.com. Do it right now and sign up for our weekly newsletter. We are giving short tips, tricks, foundational advice, things that we've done, things that we've heard from other people, things that we've um, learned in some of these marriage workshops that we facilitate that are going to be able to help turn you into a power couple and help you build a legacy driven marriage and a legendary family that long lasts long after you're gone. So do not delay legacy driven marriages.com. Go sign up for that and get the newsletter and continue to listen to this podcast. But until the next time, get into the arena of your marriage, keep fighting for your relationship and keep elevating your generational legacy. And we'll see you guys next Tuesday. Let's go.